Welcome to Business Better, a podcast designed to help businesses navigate the new normal. I'm your host, Steve Burkhart. After a long career at global consumer products company, BIC, where I served as Vice President of Administration, General Counsel, and Secretary, I'm now Special Counsel in the Litigation Department at Ballard's Bar, a law firm with clients across industries and throughout the country. This is the first episode in our new Sustainability Spotlight series, highlighting the sustainability efforts that businesses are taking to combat climate change and other environmental challenges. This episode features a discussion with Alan Horowitz, Vice President of Sustainability at Aramark, a leading global provider of food and facility services. Alan provides insight on Aramark's Be Well, Do Well ESG platform. We also discuss Aramark's goal to reach net zero emissions by 2050 and what they're focusing on in order to reach this goal. Speaking with Mr. Horowitz is my Ballard Spar colleague, Brendan Collins, a partner in Ballard's Philadelphia office and leader of the firm's manufacturing and consumer products industry group. So now let's turn the episode over to Brendan. Hello, and welcome to Ballard Spar's Sustainability Podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Collins. I'm the leader of the manufacturing and consumer products group here at Ballard Spar. And today, I'm very happy to have with me a special guest, Alan Horowitz, who is the Vice President of Sustainability for Aramark. Hello, Alan. Brendan, how are you? Good to see you, and thanks for uh, inviting me to this. Well, we're thrilled to have you. Um, Aramark is an extraordinarily interesting business, particularly in the sustainability sector, and we we're very happy to have you here with us today to discuss the company as program. But before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your role at Aramark, and how you wound up in the sustainability business? Sure, I'll uh, keep this brief. So I am the Vice President of uh, Sustainability, as you mentioned. So that involves leading the team of professionals that have responsibility for driving, embedding, and helping the company deliver our sustainability commitments across the, the globe. We drive what we call the planet components of our overall ESG um, sustainability platform, Be Well, Do Well. And we can get into the details of that. Uh, my team also is responsible for enabling and facilitating, promoting the governance around ESG reporting, data collection, carbon accounting, external engagement with sort of the raters and rankers, if you will, uh, board collaboration and the like. So it's really a connectivity between sort of the substantive sustainability programs that we're progressing and the governance around that. Well, for our listeners who may not interact directly with Aramark or may not be aware that they're interacting directly with Aramark, could you tell us a little bit about the company and its business? Sure. Uh, Aramark, as I said, a global company providing food service and hospitality across uh, a variety of sectors, including collegiate colleges and universities, our sports and entertainment business, workplace, K-12, so student nutrition, healthcare, corrections, and destinations. We have a, a very prominent destinations business where we're leading and operating many of the National Park Service sites and beautiful places like Yosemite. So we are uh, operating across you know, many sectors of the economy, proudly so. And given that broad range of businesses that you serve, how does Aramark establish and pursue its sustainability goals? It's complicated. We have, as I mentioned, a platform that we call Be Well, Do Well. That is a very intentionally a people and planet set of commitments that, by definition, intersect across all of our work. So everything from safety to our diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, our community engagement work, our uh, healthy eating initiatives, and then our sort of core planet-focused pillars around 
food waste, circularity, in other words, our efforts to reduce our reliance on single-use plastics and the like, um, efficient operations, so energy efficiency, water efficiency, and a quite sophisticated program that covers our sourcing, our responsible sourcing initiative. So there's an ethical sourcing component of that, driving where we drive our diversity-related commitments, and also a sustainable sourcing comp- component of that, where we're promoting um, our animal welfare-related targets, otherwise, otherwise driving the planet-focused programs into our supply chain. And underpinning all of this is our you know, quite focused effort to reduce our greenhouse gas footprint. We have a, a science-based target that we received validation for last year and are now very much you know, in the process of, of building a pathway around that and, and implementing it. I should also mention, we can get into this, a part of our, our climate strategy involves our commitment to reduce our food emissions, in particular uh, 25% by 2030 in the U.S. under the uh, framework of the World Resources Institute's Cool Food Pledge. So that is a, as we'll discuss, you know, food is a material component of our greenhouse gas footprint, and we have a very focused effort on in that space. Well, so let's unpack that a little bit. People address scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Uh, there are um, There are some companies that focus on scope one and scope two emissions, but don't include scope three. But Aramark does involve targeting scope three emissions as part of its uh, core program. Is that right? Scope three is 99% of our uh, our greenhouse gas inventory. So we'd be uh, remiss if we did not address that component of our our emissions. So yeah, our science-based target is across all scopes. We have a a set of near-term targets to take us to 2030 and then a 2050 net zero target. So our programs, our initiatives are by definition encompassing all three scopes. Now, 99% is a pretty big share of the company's emissions. Can you tell me a little bit more about how those scope three emissions come about? Sure. I mean, in effect, about 70% of that scope three is associated with our purchased goods and services. And the largest component of that is food, food we buy and serve. And that's not surprising given, given the way we operate, our, the services we provide. So you look back into the supply chain and, and that, that footprint. Uh, another significant component of our scope three is associated with our operations at client locations. So the way we run our business, we're working in in the houses of our clients under other people's roofs. Uh, so there is a component of our missions associated with you know, the operations that we are carrying out day in and day out. So between those two components, and there are other elements, food waste is a relatively small, surprisingly relatively small component of our overall footprint. It's about 2 or 3% that surprises some people. Um, there's a, often a default to assume that food waste is a large contributor to a company like ours footprint. That's not to say food waste isn't a focus of ours and for a variety of reasons. We can get into that. But from a greenhouse gas inventory perspective, it's actually relatively small. Uh, so it's purchase goods and services. It's emissions at client locations and then you know several other, other components that comprise our scope three. Right. And so you serve a, a number of different industries. You, you highlighted a couple of the education industry, um, the sports and entertainment industry, and you, you do work in food service, but you also have other services that you provide to these organizations. Is that true? Yeah. So we, we, I mean, food is the predominant component of our work. We have a facilities business where we're providing operation and maintenance, landscaping, and other facility maintenance and management-related services. There's a certainly a component of our sustainability commitments that are associated with that. As I mentioned, we have a you know, very prominent destinations business where we're operating any number of National Park Service sites, the destinations that you know we are as a country quite proud of, uh, including Yosemite, 
in particular and, and many others. So the scope of our our operations and it, the connectivity to you know, our sustainability agenda is is diverse, but it's primarily through from a particularly from a greenhouse gas perspective. It's primarily through the lens of our food service operations. Tell us a little bit, if you will, about some of the uh, shorter and longer term goals that Aramark has. You you mentioned the Cool Foods goal, which is, I think you said, it has a 2030 horizon. What are some of the other goals you're aiming for? So I'll come back to our greenhouse gas commitments in a moment, but let me touch upon some other aspects. We have a number of sourcing related commitments in the animal welfare space, uh, deforestation related cage-free eggs, better chicken commitments. So you know, there's a lot of work going on in that sourcing space that goes beyond just for food and climate. Obviously, it's all interconnected. We have some very ambitious and, and proud goals and targets around broadening our diverse, extending the, our spend with diverse businesses, local businesses. So there's a whole component of our agenda that is about sort of our sourcing commitments. We also have a commitment, a target to reduce our food waste by 50% by 2030 in line with the U.S. Uh, DA's program. We are setting as we speak and implementing very ambitious targets when it comes to circularity. So our, pla- our commitment to reduce our reliance on single-use items um, to both elimination where we can, but certainly reduction with more environmentally preferable, compostable, and the like uh, alternatives. We are in the process of promoting reusable programs as, as those options evolve. We actually just introduced within the last several months a, uh, a, re- a turnkey reusable serviceware service in our headquarters facility here in Philly. So there are lots of opportunities in that space. That's a very diverse range of commitments. And it's kind of, we we sometimes get overly focused to the climate change chase, which is easy to reduce to numbers and percentage reduction commitments and things like that. What you have just described is a really long roster of efforts that seem, from my perspective, to be less easily quantifiable, certainly more difficult to compare in a uniform way to what other companies might be doing. Is that true? Oh, that's an accurate statement, Brendan. The reality of it is, you know, our operations have to be understood through the lens of what we're doing day in and day out at our client locations. And I, what I always say, and certainly what we embrace, is that our ability to deliver any of these commitments, or even to set, you know, priorities in many respects, is a function of the partnerships and collaboration we have with clients, what those clients are embracing themselves. And you have you know, lots of companies, of course, that are adopting their own science-based targets and zero waste commitments and the like. Colleges and universities doing the same. The healthcare industry is really embracing the sustainability agenda. Of course, you know, protection of, of our lands through the lens of our destinations business is prominent. So our commitments, our, you know, our entire strategy is sort of, not sort of, it is built off the platform of all of our operations across our different client sectors. But we have to, at the same time, prioritize our programs, understand who we are, what we want to achieve, and then connect the dots between those commitments and our our clients while ma- ensuring that we're maintaining a proper sort of foundation or baseline or set of guardrails for ensuring that you know if you bring in Aramark to provide your food service you know what you get and how we then deliver that becomes a function of the planning and 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 execution that we do on the ground every day with our clients so in terms of the more easily quantifiable commitments then, where where are you with respect to those greenhouse reduction, those, the science-based targets that you've described earlier? So we secured validation of, of our science-based targets last summer. We are building and, 
executing a pathway to their delivery. We published in the most recent version of our Be Well, Do Well progress report that was that came out at the end of January, a emerging pathway to, to net zero that actually quantifies these different component parts and provides that lens that I just shared about you know, where we are with relative to scope one, two, and three, and in particular demonstrates how prominent the PG&S, the purchase goods and services component is for us. And in parallel, working towards this cool food pledge, we are you know, working feverishly on both the supply and the demand side. And I think that's it's important to think about that, particularly through the lens of of food emissions. So our ability to you know, drive down that purchase goods and services number and, and ultimately get to, to net zero is a function of both addressing what we're buying and working with our supply chain to, you know, over time, hopefully reduce the carbon intensity of what we buy, but in parallel providing consumers with a broader range of options and in particular plant forward options, plant based options that without restricting choice, um, we hope will, you know, nudge and, 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 and drive behaviors towards options and that are delicious and compelling and, you know, as flavorful as any menu offering we can provide, but have reduced carbon footprint. And that we can get into the details, but that's sort of the essence of our cool food program uh, that we've embarked on in partnership with the World Resources Institute. And uh, that program is being expanded rapidly as we speak to, you know, helpfully you know, move the needle on our food emissions platform and our performance. That highlights the really delicate balance on that scale because your success in reducing emissions depends not only to some degree on what your clients, the the institutions that bring you on campus or to the park or wherever you're serving them, but also the choices that the person in line with the tray makes in choosing his or her own meal. Precisely. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. We, we, there's only so much that's within our control. And we're actually you know, working very intentionally, again, with the World Resources Institute. And they have a playbook for this type of, of program with our culinary teams, our chefs, our those folks across our mark who are building the the recipes and the menu options and making decisions on what to serve, where to serve, how to serve, that we hope will help shape that kind of behavior. But again, at the end of the day, we want to be a service provider of choice, and that means providing consumers with what they want uh, and with not restricting options, but also through education and, as I said, behavioral nudges and you know, continued excellence in how we we build uh, flavorful plant forward recipes that over time we'll see that footprint reduce does product labeling play much of a role in that strategy how do you communicate those changes to your your ultimate audience which is you know past your client yeah so cool food the cool food meals program is actually a branded labeled initiative. So through marketing collateral and promotions and you know, very visible tagging of cool food options, we can we can promote it that way. And you know that's that's sort of on the demand side, you know, the consumer facing side. We have we have programs as well that are focused on tagging what we buy and making sure that that's visible to us as we make choices on the supply side. So it's a it's a hybrid of, of, of initiatives all designed to you know reconcile our commitments with our our, our our sustainability commitments, our cool food pledge, our science-based target with our commitment to be the food service provider of choice in a way that is aligned with our Be Well, Do Well framework and specifically our 
pledge and our commitment to reduce the food emissions of our operations. So you mentioned earlier that many of the clients of Aramark have their own goals, their own achievements. How does the company essentially split credit or otherwise, you know, arrange expectations to support the efforts of the customers in under whose roofs you operate with Aramark's own goals? The bottom line is what we do in the sustainability space is a partnership with our clients. So yes, we have lots of co- colleges and universities, companies, healthcare providers, you name it, who have their own set of commitments. They may be also their own you know, net zero targets, their own waste reduction objectives. Some have zero waste platforms. So our job as we pursue new partnerships or build on existing ones is to collaborate with those clients, understand where the connections are, where the programs are aligned, where they're not, have those discussions and build a plan around them and then ensure that day in and day out we are operating in a manner that is driving delivery of those commitments. Uh, to your earlier point, some are e- more readily quantifiable than others. We can have food waste goals that can be you know, tracked, particularly back of house food waste numbers. We can have collective targets around emissions on site, but it's easier to, we can quantify actually those food emissions. At times it's harder to quantify the emissions associated with our operations, because we may not have sub-metering that's focused on our own activities. So, you know, these are nuances and complexities that we do need to manage. But at the end of the day, our ability to deliver on our commitments is directly tied with the partners, you know, independent, in fact, on the partnerships that we build with our clients that, and, and as you say, they're, that's a, it's a heterogeneous client base and the nature and extent and degree of, of the, the, the commitments of, of those clients varies, can vary substantially. So it's about day in and day out working on the ground to connect the dots and hopefully pursue this sustainability journey together. Well, how do you see Aramark's programs evolving over the next few years? And are there trends in the industry that you're watching very closely? We're always watching trends. Of course, we have a close eye on the regulatory developments. We can talk about the SEC's climate disclosure rule that was finalized the other day. Um, There are European regulatory reporting requirements, CSRD in particular. There's the California rule. So. And then, then there are a host of of municipality or state and local regulations emerging in the in the circularity space, single use plastics, food waste. So we're continuously, of course, monitoring those developments and and engaged in the policy development work where where it makes sense too. I and mean, we're actively involved with a number of NGOs trying to drive progress across a number of those areas. So. You know, we're looking outside, but we're also, of course, continuing to look inside and understanding from a materiality perspective, a prioritization perspective, what makes sense, where Aramark should be focusing its effort. Be Well, Do Well as a platform is a reflection of materiality work we did several years ago. We're actually coming up on the five-year timing framework of, of that of that current set of goals and are about to embark on a strategic initiative to refresh those those goals and those will be informed by you know core or classic prioritization or materiality reviews that are often behind them and in particular now with the CSRD double materiality framework we expect to use that at least in part to inform what makes sense, what matters for Aramark, what matters for Aramark's clients and and, and consumers, what matters for all of our stakeholders, right? Our stakeholder community is vast from investors to students, 
buying food each and every day on college campuses and everyone in between. So, you know, our job is to, is to look inside, look outside and align on a set of priorities that makes sense for us while being careful that we don't complicate things in a way that would undermine our progress. We want to be focused on the right things and make real tangible progress. So you, you mentioned a few different regulatory frameworks that have emerged or not emerged on climate reporting specifically. You mentioned the uh, SEC's rule on climate reporting, which came out a few days before we recorded this podcast, and most notably decided to exclude, the SEC decided to exclude scope three emissions. You mentioned the uh, European Union's Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the CSRD, that is a different flavor and certainly would incorporate the holistic reporting style that Scope 3 emissions reflect. And in addition, we have California's pair of climate disclosure rules that are still working their way towards implementation and being fully fleshed out as to what, what that means, but certainly a wide net that captures many companies, and that also includes scope three emissions. So what what are your thoughts about how those mandatory reporting frameworks address or create challenges for a company, even a company that is as focused on reducing scope three emissions as air markets? It's a complex world. (laughs) The, uh, you know, the reality of it is that we have to walk and chew gum at the same time, right? We've, we've got to keep a clear eye on these emerging frameworks, ensure we are positioned to comply, regardless of, you know, sort of the, the differentiation. And we can get into the details of how CSRD, SEC, California, sort of compare and contrast. But the bottom line is, you know, there is a common denominator here. I mean, scope three is covered, as you say, by California and CSRD. And of course, it's covered by us. You know, we, we've we made a, a firm commitment in this space. We are investing in carbon accounting software and other initiatives to ensure we have, we understand our footprint clearly, that we can com- communicate that footprint effectively and transparently, and that we're accountable for, for where we are and where we're going. You know, 2050 net zero targets are easy to easy in you know in quotes to secure they're much harder to deliver and and our obligation is to not only commit to delivering them but to demonstrate year in and year out how we're doing that's important for us in the governance that we deploy internally i i'm accountable to our leadership our board our people to be able to demonstrate where we are and where we aren't um, against those targets because those are the public commitments. So, you know, back to your question, the regulatory framework is getting more complicated for sure. We have to ensure that we have the right attention to those requirements, that we're in a position to comply. But that's not what's driving us, frankly. Our goals are and our programs are driving us. Our commitments to our clients, you know, as we've said, that, that are quite, you know, sophisticated and diverse and expect a lot of us and just like we expect a lot of ourselves. So I hope that over time, the twain shall meet that you know, what we need to do to comply with CSRD, SEC, California, and other requirements that, that are yet to emerge. And we can you know, speculate on where those will come from uh, while delivering against these commitments. This is hard work and you know, we don't have all the answers. I think it's ignorant to suggest that, you know, companies who have secured net zero targets necessarily know, you know, exactly how they're going to get there. Scope three, you know, as a reflection of, you know, the debate, the intense debate that SEC, I'm sure, went through in terms of whether to include it. It's a reflection of how complicated and um, still uncertain scope three accounting is uh, and how changeable it is. So, the external policy environment is important for driving consistency and expectations and, you know, certainly through the lens of investors and, and other stakeholders. But, you know, our programs are a function of our mission, our commitment to 
do the right thing to protect the uh, and enhance the the health of people and and the planet. Well, I think there's no better way to end this podcast than on that note. I want to thank you for sharing your time with us, for breaking down for us in an understandable way the very complicated problems that companies can face in this area when they really roll up their sleeves to tackle sustainability issues. So thank you. My pleasure, Brendan. Enjoyed the chat and thanks for the opportunity. You bet. And um, I hope we'll have you back someday to hear more about how Aramark's been doing on this subject. And to you and our listeners, I wish you a very pleasant day and thank you. Thanks again to Brendan Collins and Alan Horowitz. Make sure to visit our website, www.ballardspar.com, where you can find the latest news and guidance from our attorneys. Subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. If you have any questions or suggestions for the show, please email podcast at ballardspar.com. Stay tuned for a new episode coming soon. Thank you for listening.